I'm going to show you five or six other uh, sounds that, of the hundreds that have been done, sounds that have been recorded from the outside world and made available for playing back here. Some of these have been shaped, some of them are used just as they were recorded. The machine, you know, the, the, the computer part, is going through my notebook and picking out these sounds. It takes six seconds to get all the information about one sound out uh, off the disk and into the machine. When it takes it off, it doesn't destroy it. It just reads it out uh, as if you were playing a tape. The keyboard here is a six-octave touch-sensitive keyboard. And my program, uh, which I wrote with just a couple of commands earlier, uh, is now allocating each sound to a different octave in the keyboard. You can do this during live performance, uh, you can do this in a studio situation, or as part of the uh, composer's language, which is uh, available with this instrument. <coughs> Down below here, we have, a, we have a floor tom. I have just one octave of it. Of course, as I go up and down the keys, the, the, the tone gets both longer and lower. I've instructed uh, the, uh, I put instructions in the program for the velocity information off the key to control the loudness. So the harder I hit this, the louder it will get. That's uh, analogous in analog synthesizers to putting a patch cord. I've patched the velocity output of this keyboard to the loudness control input of that one voice. Next up is, what is it? there it is, it's a uh, sitar. There's a little bit of uh, a, a long attack there before the note actually begins. That's the way it was recorded. You see, all the characteristic variations of the sitar are in there because that is a recording of the entire waveform of the sitar. It's not a simplified re recording. <clears throat> Next one is, a, I believe, a Rhodes. People seem surprised that it sounds like what it is. It's a recording. It's a, it should sound like a Rhodes. Uh, this is a... This is a ride symbol. It's actually an octave too low. Why don't I get a little higher for you? That was too high. Uh, there it is. If you want a little bigger symbol, you go down a note. Okay. Next octave up is a glass harmonica. Where is it? That's... Oh, there it is. Okay. I forgot that uh, that this particular voice for the loudness was controlled from one of the sliders. What makes sounds like this glass harmonica and the Rhodes and the sitar interesting is the, very, the first couple of cycles at the beginning. If you were to synthesize any of these in a rational way, you'd be at it all day. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's not fun to do or musically useful to, to synthesize some, something short and interesting, but the fact is uh, that uh, a, a great deal of things that I, I personally wouldn't know how to synthesize are available just by picking up a microphone and turning it on. This last one that uh, I heard a giggle off in the front is what you think it is. It, it's a Fender Telecaster through a Marshall amp. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when electronic music began, it, it was the province of the academic community. Uh, you know, some of my best friends are academicians. But uh, the, what? These were the European academicians. They took sides. They, 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 they adopted stances and they said, well, electronic music only is sine waves or only is tape manipulation. And there's always been a tendency to, for people to say, 
you're cheating if you do this and not that. Now, some of you may, may have that feeling, a little bit of that feeling inside, looking at this instrument. Uh, even though it, you wouldn't, you'd feel a little bit silly saying it, you may feel, well, that, that's, that's not as cool as actually making a sound from scratch. Well, the feeling I've gotten after working with musicians for as long as I have is, is that it's the sound itself that's important and the ability to work with it, not where it comes from. Musicians will play on cigar boxes if they don't have anything else because they, they are manipulators of sound, uh, not purists. <clears throat> okay. The voices are still loaded in, and, and until I change that now, uh, my, my keyboard will play those six particular voices, but now I'm going to change it. Now I'm, I'm clearing the, uh, all the memory out so I can put something else in. How important is it to be able to shape a sound once it's in the machine? Well, here, here's an example. This is a recording of a, of a xylophone bar. Oops, I, better, I didn't clear out it enough. <laughs> Clear it out enough. There we go. And talk about looking for musical resources. That's the note that was recorded. Down here, it's a different sound. It's a different sound because. Uh, a xylophone or marimba that's, that's balanced uh, actually changes the waveform as you go down. When you use, use the same waveform down here, it, it comes across to our ears as a basically a different sound. Up here it's very delicate. So just by picking a different range from that which the, re the sound was recorded in, you can get a different quality. Now I've uh, taken out our whittling knife and I've shaped the sound down so it decays faster. It decays much faster, as a matter of fact. And you'll see that just doing that changes the sound. Because the sound a little bit wooden. Okay. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to show you what happens if you shape the attack. <laughs> 